Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we'll bring you day 468 of Russian invasion into Ukraine. This one is a somewhat extracurricular stream dedicated to the recent events unfolding in Ukraine, especially in the south, where the Kachovska, I guess, was blown up. So Alexei and Mark, being in Europe at the Brussels summit, they had a chance to do another one today and discuss these uh, events. Thank you guys for your continuous support of this channel. Bill, thank you for your super thanks. That's always appreciated. Please do not forget to subscribe and click the like button if you have not done that yet. And with that, day 468. Enjoy. Dear friends, glad to see you all on Fagin Life. It is Tuesday, June 6th. Time is 11 p.m. in Kiev, same time in Moscow. And we're doing a regular stream with Alexei Rostovich. In some sense, it is uh, extra curriculum related to the extraordinary events in the South. I'm glad to see you, Alexei, day 468. And I have to confess that I've just uh, parted with Alexei very recently after the events of the day. But uh, we're getting together again. And we did not, for, uh, did not really have uh, much time between that and the stream. So an ask, of course, of all those 40,000 of you that are starting with us, uh, please click the like button, share the stream if you have not uh, done that yet, and do not forget to subscribe to Figgin Live, to Alexei Rostovich, and to the Privateer Station if you are listening or watching that in English. It was a busy day today. We had a bunch of meetings in the European Parliament. And... Uh, Unfortunately, there were more rapid events unfolding in the south of Ukraine, so we had to do another stream today. And there'll be uh, more translations coming soon of the events in the Brussels in the European Parliament. So with that, let's start with the main topic. I think there is some providence in this topic and some fatality uh, and finality of some events. They actually did blow up Kachovska power station and it was rather obvious that the, there was a high probability of that dam being exploded by the Russians, by Putin regime, either as a retaliation or as tactical measure to slow down certain maneuvers of the Ukrainian military. And you did mention in your social media, Alexei, that on one hand this is probably a way to prevent a possible military action in that region by Ukraine. And also, I'm personally thinking this is also another angle uh, that they just, there's no other way for them to respond to Ukrainian successes on the front. And from their uh, futile futility of their position, they just tried to do something like take a big dump in the middle of your room or, or get on your bed like they did in. Um, near Kiev, in the suburbs of Kiev, and just take a shit on the owner's bed and take pictures, take selfies with it. So they always keep supporting the worst ideas that we projected about them. Let's discuss it. Formally Mark, this is, by the way, their territory. They annexed it, right, with the fake referendums. So that's how they treat their own. Speaking of that event, I think there are two main reasons. First is definitely to preclude our troops from crossing Dnipro River in the south near the islands. And they actually started today uh, with statements in uh, social media, yay, we washed the Ukrainians out down the river. And the same story that they had in MH17 when initially they had for a couple hours uh, giddy tweets about, hey, we shot down the bird, and then they immediately changed the tone when they realized what happened. Same thing here. They, uh, for a couple hours uh, during the night after the explosion, they were screaming how successful it all is, and then they changed the tone when they realized things are not going the way they wanted them to go. And uh, the other one is that their demonstration to the world that these are the consequences of Ukrainian counteroffensive. And it may get worse. Maybe Crimean Titan will explode, the chemical factory that the landmine on the mine with explosives to the brim. Or maybe Zaporozhka nuclear power plant 
uh, may have an accident or something else. And with that, they are trying to persuade everybody to sit down at the table, freeze the conflict, and uh, discuss the terms of stopping this war. Why? Because they do not believe in themselves. They understand that our counteroffensive will wipe them out, and they do not have enough military resources to resist. That's why everybody and their uncle are coming out of the woodwork to try to say something about stopping the Ukrainian counteroffensive. That's why we see Orban coming out from Hungary and saying, oh, let's stop the terrible counteroffensive. And even the most remote countries where Russia has some influence also coming out with uh, suggestions to sit down and freeze it, uh, to stop that counteroffensive. Yet it will happen. And no measure from their side has a potential to stop it. Early in the morning, I made a post in social media that blowing up the dam means that at least they are not expecting to be able to hold the left bank of Dnieper and Kherson region. And the fact that uh, they blew up the dam that supplies water to Crimea, that also puts a big question mark if they're even expecting to hold Crimea in the long term. Alexei, did we lose the voice, the audio for a sec? Okay, we're back. Okay. Yep, let's continue. So, right before we started the stream, I saw some pictures of the canal that uh, brings water to Crimea. And that canal has barely left any water already. Tomorrow they probably will have almost none. And how are they going to bring water to Crimea in this case? I don't think they can't, they look into the future, right? One of the other factors in the story that they did not even tell their own troops that they will be doing that, part of the troops. We have radio intercepts uh, that some blog posts, some outposts of their military died completely. Did they just drown? Yeah, they drowned. And the wave was uh, big enough and they did not have time to react, so it just washed them away. So they murdered their own soldiers. That's what Bolsheviks and commies did in '41 when they blew up Dnipropetrovsk gas and they blew up uh, Easternska water reservoir near Moscow, where there were tens of thousands of civilians and military who died as a result of that. I do not believe in historical curse, but this is definite conscious choice of the regime and the pattern that they have used, that country has used before. And this is sort of a culmination of all their activities and ways to wage war. And the weirdest is that they have warned part of their military about this event and they have not warned the others. So they have some grades apparently in their military and a mobilized Russian never knows what uh, grade is he uh, does he belong to while in the military. And what we noticed, they were saving their motorized, uh, mechanized uh, detachments. They were, those were told, told, those were moved out. And the infantry ones, they were not. Oh yeah, we get it. The equipment is more important than uh, just lives. Yep, equipment is more important. I'll ask for permission, Mark, maybe in the next stream we can put some of the radio intercepts if I get a permission from our military to post some of it, how the drowning Russian troops are screaming in the radio. This is the culmination of it. We know that Putin likes to cosplay Stalin, that he actually took Saakashvili back uh, before the conflict in Georgia to the office uh, of Stalin in Kremlin. And this is the culmination of uh, inhumanity, one of the biggest man-made catastrophes, ecological catastrophes. And we talked with the president of European Parliament uh, today, and she was asking especially for the European audience, what would be the consequences? Uh, so to give her a little more ammo to support uh, and to counter different uh, questions. So speaking of that, flooding and destroying the dam and flooding Kherson, that has uh, long lasting consequences. And Italians were not pleasantly surprised with the fact that it might affect the supply of uh, bread and grain to Africa. And specialists, we do not know the full extent of this uh, tragedy but uh, and the consequences, but experts already calling it the biggest man-made catastrophe after 
Japanese uh, after Fukushima, after nuclear catastrophe there. And of course, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy of human life loss. People really uh, are upset when uh, things like that happen. But by the way, there are also a lot of animals who drowned as well. Yeah, you actually made a post about uh, the zoo, Kachowski Zoo. They had about 300 different animals, and it's only the water swimming animals uh, that survived. Everybody else drowned. And the owners of the zoo, they made all the effort to try to keep the animals alive during the occupation. But with that event, yeah, the zoo is gone. And it's not, uh, it's only one problem. It's not all of it. That canal was also feeding the irrigation system of uh, southern Houston region. And how will it be able to grow crops without that water? It's a big question. Nobody can yet evaluate the economic impact of destroying that irrigation system. This is something that cannot be restored in a year or even two years. This is a big problem uh, on the international scale, not just by the cynicism and the fact uh, of what they've done, but uh, by the consequences and potential lasting consequences. And I want to tell our listeners that uh, the arguments, these arguments were taken very seriously in Europe. Europe is not happy with uh, these threats. So this is Putin's way to wage wars. All right. We have 150,000 with us. And Mark, we understand that uh, military-wise, they washed away their first line of defense. Uh, in some places, even the second. And in others, it reached even the third. As experts are saying that the water will go down in about 10 days, but after this flood, the banks, the lower banks, will be messy and muddy. Militarily, I do not see us using that as a main direction of counteroffensive. It would be a suicide to cross that river under the Russian fire. That would not have been the main direction of a fight. But uh, they still went for this, and uh, they did decide to do it to protect their flank, their left flank, uh, probably realizing that they're not capable to hold anything if Ukraine starts doing even anything uh, on this side. And, and now they probably will regroup near Militopol and uh, form a line militopol Jankoy towards Crimea uh, and concentrate there, but I want to emphasize that it's easier to hit concentrated troops, it's more effective for HIMARS and artillery. And uh, whatever they maneuver that will not preclude our military from wiping them off from the southern region and we'll see it soon all right um there is another branch of this topic and i think we may want to bring the video that was uh in one of our streams about seven months ago you know some people like to post and say that Fagin and Rostovich are propagandists and uh visiting this event in europe i discovered with some surprise to myself that uh, some of the people are still whining about us uh, being propagandists. So, okay, well, maybe you have some interest in Ukraine being from Ukraine. Me personally, I do not expect to get anything from Ukraine. I'm not getting any support, any financial support. Uh, we're truly independent in this case. And my convictions are the ones that drive me, not any financial or anything else. So. I want to highlight that we are prognosticating different events here. And we also do the analytics. We never ignore the facts. Of course, we do want Putin's regime to go down, but we never ignore the facts. Um, and that's, I think, our strength. Let's take a look at the event at our stream from seven months ago, how Alexei was bright in predicting these events. I'm, I'm just a host, but let's uh, take a listen and see how much it coincides with unfolded today. So you heard probably that uh, Kachovska power station is in, water power station is in the news now. The Russian side is uh, peddling the story that Ukrainian military will blow it up or planning to blow it up and that's regardless of the fact that it is Russian side that is holding it they put explosives all over it and uh, they control that place 
So why do you think they're doing it? Do you think they'll blow it up, that dam? It has a very cynical but obvious military use, Mark. Military uses in flooding the left bank for uh, several miles wide, for a significant depth, and uh, prevent us from crossing the river and creating the purge for us to continue advancement towards Crimea on that bank. So there are two banks there. They could probably flood half Kherson as well. No, right bank is high. They, it's very unlikely they'll flood the right bank, but they will flood the left. Will it make it harder to cross the river, or what will it do? Mark, the left low bank will completely be flooded for many, many kilometers towards Crimea. It will be very difficult to cross it, and it will be nearly impossible to use it for military perch where you can continue your maneuvers from. So by blowing this up, they'll probably protect their flank from any Ukrainian military activity. And that's definitely, that's an obvious advantage for them in this uh, part of the front. And then they can concentrate their troops on Zaporozhsky direction more. And the fact that 200,000 citizens, they don't care. Oh yeah, they don't, they don't give a fuck about that. It's the regime. They only care about providing for certain military conditions. So they're not uh, putting explosive on the power plant. It's a serious uh, system that uh, you need to maybe drop nuke to destroy it. It was designed for nuclear war. But they put explosives in the system of uh, water gates. That's an easy way to blow up. And OK, so what is an easy way to restore it, in your opinion? It is impossible, right, to do it under fire during the military operation while the war is raging. How do you repair gates? Because they'll be probably reaching out to that and shelling it back. Is there a way to repair it? No. No, not during the war. This will be a capital catastrophe, a huge disaster, man-made ecological disaster. And the region of catastrophe, by the size of it, will probably be close to the Chernobyl power, nuclear power station. So it will be a pretty serious pro problem, even if we fully succeed, take a kick, a kick all of them out. Um, it will be a problem for years to come to fix. So yeah, here is our stream seven months ago. And our viewers can gauge for themselves how predicting we were in uh, that stream. And are we just uh, myopic uh, bloggers or we actually do understand the logic of Russian regime, especially when they're facing the complete and utter defeat in the, on the war front in Ukraine? Okay, so now let's uh, play it out a little. They blew up the dam. They gave a signal that we're complete fucktards and we can probably also blow up one of the Zaporozhye power, nuclear power station plants. They might also use maybe tactical nuke as well. Why are they doing it? What for? Besides an attempt to stop the counteroffensive. Probably to scare the West to a degree that they would uh, hold our hands and would call upon us to sit down at the table of negotiations. That's impossible, right? We understand that. Yeah, they understand that Ukraine will not sit at the table. They think we're mad here and we're not going to talk to them. Um, we're not mad, but we're not going to. And they want to target the countries that are supplying military arms and aid to Ukraine. And they hope that uh, they will maybe have a say to stop us. I think this is a false calculation. Nothing will stop us. Ukrainians will not be stopped by any Russian military force, even by using tactical nukes. We'll only become angrier. And we have enough forces to wipe them out now. Yeah, we keep hearing uh, notes from the official people from leadership of Ukraine that you guys have all the equipment and military resources. Yeah, Kuleba and President, uh, they attended a meeting today. Uh, Outcome was they came out and said that our readiness is at peak level. But the possible 
readiness to counteroffensive on the Russian side indicates how scared and uh, excited they are in a bad way for them that they're really waiting to be to get their ass kicked anytime now. It's good. It's good that they're waiting because yeah, it will be kicked. It will be handed to them. And you know, I want to bring another topic, Alexei, here, since we're somewhat wrapping up uh, the explosion of Kachovska hydroelectric power station. There is a group of experts now in the media that are saying that not everything is too obvious, as they're saying, that maybe it was a result of uh, accumulated technological issues that this dam had, it was shelled, it was holding for a while, and now it finally broke up. And this is one line of conversation. We're not discussing what Kremlin says, because they started posting now that Ukraine attacked the dam uh, to win some time to regroup their uh, military and to create humanitarian disaster. That is their uh, bold uh, bull in the United Nations, uh, Nebenza, a representative of Putin's federation. And this is the extremes. The other, other group of experts saying that it's not obvious. Uh, what can we answer to those? Maybe not even from the motivation side. I think uh, it's obvious uh, for Moscow their motivation in blowing this up. But why all these versions are fake and cannot withstand criticism? All right. So we talked about that before. The Western culture always uh, imposes a position of deep skeptics, skepsis uh, on uh, very skeptical position on the events because in any case you'll either be pleasantly surprised or you'll be right and that is what they're playing that we nobody was there we have not seen them blowing it up we have not seen the order to do it and we do have these uh, proof we saw videos from october when they brought trucks with explosives we got the news back then when and how it was they were laid up in the power station and also we, we knew that back then and our radio intercepts also indicate that they did warn some of their troops about the explosion so they had time to evacuate and they did not warn the others and how would you know to inform and to warn your military if you are not the authors of that explosion so it's pretty straightforward all right let's also discuss the consequences i think moscow is getting closer and closer to being recognized as a terrorist regime because echo side this is a huge terrorist act with one of the goals is to besides uh, being related to counteroffensive and trying to influence the ukrainian side and to make it more difficult on the military front this is also murdering people civilians and uh, animals and agriculture on the left bank. Do you think there is any speed, any steam in uh, that direction for calling Russia what they are? Uh, I see Western leaders actually being rather unequivocal in the statements they make. Yes, um, Charles Michel called it a crime, military crime. Head of NATO called it a uh, egregious act so the remarks were very straightforward right on from the morning when the work day started in Europe so I will be on one hand yeah they are understanding what's going on but I'll be skeptical here too uh, it's my turn now Russia Putin's Russia has already done so many atrocious crimes that it's time to throw them out of United Nations just summarily take them and kick them out of there but so far we are not seeing this western political culture and the world political culture related to that skepsis is also the one that makes them think all right so what's instead if russia is not a member of the security council and the united nations will that cause more disbalance imbalance will it push russia to be more marginal to be more uh, mad in their behavior so and they need to understand that this is the blackmail. This is exactly what Russia is doing. The only way to stop that is to resist in force. 
there is no other way. There is no way to negotiate your, yourself out. And the obvious is that they don't need to do anything themselves. They need to allow Ukraine to take care of it. Just give us enough equipment, enough equipment, enough arms, and we'll take these murderers out. We will close that question. It's not even an issue. We will provide for the military defeat of Russian Federation. To uh, bring it into perspective, the energy system loss are minimal as a result. Why? Uh, please explain. That hydroelectric station was not really playing a significant role in our system. On the backdrop of 16 nuclear power plants that we have in the country, it was minimal. But the problem here is that ecological catastrophe on the left bank, probably irrigation system catastrophe for years, and uh, agriculture consequences for peoples who are getting uh, food from that region, who are getting exports. And Russia keeps trying the world. They, they always keep blackmailing and keep pushing. Today they called upon the ambassador of Belgium to Kremlin. After seeing some of the Belgian arms with the uh, uh, Legion Freedom of Russia and Russian Volunteer Corps, um, and th these were rifles, right? They were just uh, rifles that they carried. Yeah, exactly. But Belgians were weak. They allowed for these questions to come, and they started questioning too. They fretted and they published and press, and Russians immediately exploited that. And uh, yeah. They immediately announced uh, the protest and called upon the ambassador of Belgium. Why did not they call for American or German or Polish ambassador? Right, because they would tell them to f fuck off. Right, exactly. So they see, they definitely monitor keenly all the opponents on the other side and they see the ones who start to fret and wave and these are the ones where they exert pressure on. And the West doesn't really understand that feature of Russia. You understand as the opposition uh, persona, we understand as the country fighting them, we understand how they behave, how that regime behaves. But the real wisdom is to talk to people on the language that they understand and not the one that you think is right. And they understand only the very rough language, the one that puts them in place and uh, tells them there is no leeway, there is no wiggle, wiggle room for them, for all these shenanigans. The good news is that we do have enough instruments, and I think that in the nearest future, Russian command will see that all these actions did not protect them from our military action. And to make it more fun, it would be good to, that if that leads also to Europe understanding that and giving us more power for the second counteroffensive in autumn, probably F-16s and some other means. All right, let's take a look at the map also. What happened there, just to clear our conscience. Conscience. Um, nothing major happened in the last day in Zaporozhye. There is some tactical fighting in Kriminai and Liman region. There is definitely some activity. This is uh, some activity where after which they see 20 trucks with wounded coming to some of the hospitals. And in Belgrade, uh, some of their evil tongues are saying that there are still conflicts raging around Belgrade. All right, we'll show the video that Minister of Defense of Russian Federation uh, posted, saying that they destroyed uh, Leopard 2 tanks. There is a uh, very loud laughter in the interwebs because it appears that these are two American uh, crop uh, machine, uh, cropping seeding machines uh, on the fields, and uh, these are agriculture equipment. We'll show that video, and I'll be saying in parallel. So here is the video of the targeting system. And they're saying they're destroying Leopard tanks. And people are saying that this is not a tank. It is way too high above the ground. And everybody who watched that video, they're saying, no, this doesn't look like a tank. And this machine looks more like a John Deere 4830. 
you can, if you zoom in, you can distinguish agricultural equipment with wheels, and uh, it looks more like an agriculture equipment. And Russia posted that they destroyed that uh, as a military target. So other experts chiming in saying, no, this is agricultural equipment, this is not tanks. And in some media, they were discussing that some of the Ukrainian forces are waging counteroffensive and already are engaged actively in attacking Russian positions. So Russia is posting today that they pushed Ukrainians back, destroyed uh, tanks, uh, killed 15, up to 1,500 uh, Ukrainian troops. And I want to put a chair on top right and uh, kill Derislavich as well to top it. So every time when they post that, are they idiots? Do, do they think anybody believes when they post numbers like that and statements and videos like that? You know, Mark, well, I want to address that from a different angle. We have a commentary of a more interested or, I guess, uh, less interested, but also part of that uh, issue, Prigozhin, who made a statement about that post of Military of Defense. Oh, yeah, no, they officially made a statement, right, that they destroyed 1,500. Prigozhin came out and said that in order for Ukrainians to lose 1,500 fighters, the battle raging on the front needs to be at least 100 kilometers long, and it has to be really active. Russian troops have no way to wage a war at a 100 kilometer front. They're very tactical. They, there are certain hotspots where they can actively resist, otherwise they cannot. So. Konoshenkov, their spokesperson for military, is coming out regularly and making statements that nobody believes, even in Russia. And people are posting now that when Kherson was evacuating people and animals, Russian artillery opened fire on the moving civilians. And now they're also not letting people from Aleshki to evacuate. That city is... Uh, Semi sunk, and uh, they're not letting Ukrainian population to leave their houses. But yeah, not surprising. They don't give a shit about people. Yep. All right, let's go to the next topic. We've been live for about 30 minutes. There is 209,000 watching us on my channel. Oh, yeah, and I got 74,000 who joined. So, pretty good numbers. 76,000 clicked the like button. So, in the last quarter of the stream, please uh, let's uh, click that like button and push it up to 100. Um, do not forget to share links to that stream on your social media. Make sure those who need to see it, they do. Uh, and when you click the like button, it brings it to more eyeballs and to more recommended videos on YouTube. So if you are watching it now, just please make an effort, click that like button, do a nice thing for Mark and Alexei, and of course for the privateer station. And uh, do not forget to subscribe if you have not done that yet. All right. Let's discuss the topic with uh, conscription by text. And there is some interesting reaction in Russia. They are posting in their news that they're working on a way to prevent fake text messages. Uh, Kartopolov, the representative of their government, came out and with a statement saying that they are working on the format of these text messages to delineate uh, them from fake messages so the person who receives that notice on his cell phone would understand that this is a real one. And on the federal portal of uh, law and uh, active uh, legislation, they are posting more details about this new law. and. Uh, it does uh, include uh, texting the conscription prospects on their cell phones that uh, there you go. And you know the funny part, uh, people are laughing saying that now in uh, there, are, there are guys in Ukraine who are learning all the details of that formatting to keep trolling Russians. Um, and it, yeah, it just reminds me of another anecdote. Uh, yeah, let's... Uh, go to the cemetery dig up some girls so yeah if those going to the war make sure you get a black body bag with you um 
And then for those who think that nothing will happen to them in Russia, who want to just uh, say that, oh no, this is all hysteria, we'll be drinking beer and doing the usual summer pastime in Russia. No, I want to say that this is a real act they're adopting, that uh, they'll be finding any resource they can mobilize. What's your conclusion, Alexei? Oh, my conclusion is that they will mobilize everybody they want to. Exactly. And they will throw them to the front line. The problem of uh, this conscription is the fact of delivering it. As a lawyer especially, you probably understand, Mark, that this is a legal act that can be questioned and can be countered if it was not carried out properly. So here with the text messages, they are putting themselves in a weird position where they can send it, but they're painting themselves, they're trying to get rid of the problem of illegal or uh, violated delivery method. So they're trying to allow themselves a leeway and basically use a repressive methods uh, to push everybody and to probably alleviate government from different legal actions by the conscripts and uh, probable statement that I never received everything. Yeah, on, in law we call it a process outside of legal order because it's hard to fixate it in any way to record it, how it happened. Yeah, and Mark, this is the problem they're trying to solve. they running out of equipment, and the less equipment you have, you need more meat. So basically, you need double uh, the meat force if you do not have enough uh, machinery, enough uh, APCs and tanks. Today, they saved, that was the difference between the military they saved, those were the military on tanks and on APCs and with artillery. These are the ones that were saved and warned about the flood. The usual riflemen, they were not. So, and that's how they treat, that's, how, that's what, what they're preparing that system. They want to be able to throw more meat in the front. So we can uh, congratulate those who are still naively believing in Russia that it's not their war, that they can sit it out on the sofa. Yeah, well, that's uh, the, the chances to evade it are minimizing daily. And all these uh, hopeful people will probably remain somewhere in the fields of Kherson or at the mouth of Crimea, if conscripted. All right, we've been live for almost 36 minutes. There is one more topic towards the end of the stream. The countries of the West will give Ukraine, uh, will give up Ukraine and uh, they need to make sure that they provide a certain pathway for Ukraine to join the West and safety guarantees. This will be the most important outcome of the NATO summit. Otherwise, it'll be a traitorship politics from partners if uh, that pathway is not provided. The other, if, if the pathway is not, is not present, that means that uh, our allies are afraid of Russia. If we have no path to join, then there is no reason for us to join summit. When we are going to a summit, that means that uh, they want to see us in this group. I do not want to participate in the political theater. We want to understand that uh, we are going to get a path. Why did president of Ukraine make this statement? It is a very harsh statement, but he is, uh, his, this is his strong side. He uh, can speak the non-protocol language and he can post uh, and make statements rather blunt. Now, before we continue with that topic, I just got a confirmation that in uh, some of the regions of Russia, their conscription is at 10% of the plan. So with their laws, they're trying to, with the text messaging, they're trying to cover that gap. Now back to Ukrainian president. He is uh, set... He has set a stern tone, probably because we likely will not get a calendar plan about joining NATO. But uh, there are also open sources confirming that we'll likely get more military support. Uh, a lot of things were published in the media and the official statements. And it could be a uh, working format for now that we'll, give, we'll get more uh, military aid. And we will get the confirmation that yes, we will join NATO, but will not, will not be given a calendar.
And I'm rather calm about that because on one hand, what calendar can we talk about during the war that is raging? So the war needs to be over in order for us to get some pathway and calendar. This is the most important. Second, what is important is for us to continue getting a new generation of NATO arms because they're a whole other level above the conventional arms that Russia has and that will aid us in destroying them militarily. We need guarantees about joining Europe and NATO because just military equipment is only part of guarantees. We need uh, guarantees that this equipment will be continued to be supplied, that additional uh, service will be provided and uh, will be aided in modernizing and uh, will be cooperated with in terms of military production. That is what guarantees look like. And that will allow us to be to follow the United Nations uh, chapter, one of the chapters that says that each country needs to be able to defend itself. And we do want to realize the 25th article of the United Nations ourselves. We have moral grounds to do that and practical grounds to do that. Actually, I think we contributed the biggest safety investment into the West uh, when we disarmed ourselves voluntarily and removed a lot of nukes and uh, jets and back then upon the insistence of the west we gave to russia all these uh, dismantled military systems the ones they're using now on our heads because the west insisted and the west was growing up putin they were growing up this monster even after the annexation of Crim crimea and uh, the eastern ukraine as they're acknowledging at the meeting where we are at with mark that many of the Political systems in Europe were trying to do business as usual after that. So they contributed to growth of that monster. We'll see about the forms and the way the ways that NATO will support us. But our president and our diplomacy will continue to insist very sternly upon uh, getting some guarantees that uh, we are going to join NATO and Europe. Um, because we have, we're the fighting country. Daily we're losing our relatives and friends on the front. And if you scroll through media, it looks more like a necrologue for many of us. And that's why our children run to shelters. That's why they cannot sleep normally when the missiles are flying at your heads. So our president is very motivated and he's uh, got a very stern message to send. Good thing is that we have a lot of allies in NATO itself who also insist in the just as stern statements about Ukrainian joining. For example, Ursula von der Leyen, who reiterated that the finish of this war must be in accordance with the Zelensky formula, and G7 reaffirmed that in Hiroshima in Japan. And there have to be guarantees given even before that uh, joining actually legally happens, because the process may take years. And in the meantime, Ukraine will need to be still given guarantees for safety and security. So yes, we do need them. We need that support to prevent that nightmare, to prevent the second attempt of Russian Federation to invade Ukraine. And for the most part, they can be comprised of military and economic aid. Many experts are talking today that it could be a formula that Israel and the United States have. And uh, Israel is getting about $9 billion worth every year, not just militarily, but also technology. And there's a mutual exchange between two countries. So this is a special format. Similar format exists been between the United States and Korea. And this is the zone where one can dig for different uh, format options for security of Ukraine. But the fact that president will be making very stern statements in Vilnius, he is working on that. He is preparing the ground for this. I think this is, uh, this is a good move. and They need to ensure the real security of Ukraine. All right, we've been live for almost 44 minutes. Almost 217,000 are watching on my channel. About 90,000 click the like button. We are doing another stream tomorrow, a regular one, right at 10 p.m. Today is a bit uh, unusual time. People did not expect us to be alive, so, and it's also late. 
me and Alexei have been in the European Parliament for two days. There was a conference here that was run by European Parliament together with representatives of Russian opposition. Today, Ivan chaired a panel. And uh, also, me and Alexei were conducting a lot of meetings in the interests of Ukrainian politics. I guess we can formulate it this way. We had a lot of tasks to take care of. Just like some people are saying that we're drinking beer morning till evening. Uh, yeah, I wish we were. So the circumstances were interesting. And for two days, we only had time an hour later instead of 10. We're coming out live at 11 p.m. Tomorrow, we'll try to meet the usual schedule. And um, yeah, we as the war unfolds, we have to follow some of the most important events. We're not planning to do a stream today, but since they blew Kachowska water power station hydroelectric plant, we could not uh, set this one out. And tomorrow we'll have a regular stream. I also will see if I can bring Caesar to the stream, the representative of the Legion of Russia. And also there'll be other materials on my channel. So please continue following our streams. Alexei, thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, everybody. See you all. Good luck. Thank you.